Good afternoon and welcome to this industry discussion on understanding the funding opportunities for UK SMEs. My name is Adam Tyler, Executive Chairman of the Finance Intermediary and Broker Association, your host for this next session as we explore and understand the wide ranging and quite unique business finance market we benefit from here in the UK. In a moment, I'll introduce our panel members. They're all leaders of some of the most innovative lenders and platforms available today to our small business community. I want to explore how we can raise the awareness of the 350 to 400 lenders to business we have here in the UK, what can be done to improve access to them, and how we can increase the knowledge of the availability of these lenders and funders to our SMEs. You would have heard earlier in some detail about the government-backed schemes. We're not here to look back on the last 12 months, but to understand all the great work that went on before the pandemic in funding our business community and what we're doing right now for the future finance requirements of all those SMEs. I chair an organisation that looks after commercial finance intermediaries, and I've done this since 2005. We're quite lucky in the UK that we have this model. It's only replicated in the States and in Australia, but we have it here in the UK. We need to make sure that everybody understands how we can maximise this opportunity. Also for 12 years or more, I've lobbied in Westminster. I lobby on behalf of the industry for greater access to finance, trying to raise awareness. The group that I represent, um, we have 1.2 million SMEs within that organisation for 117 different trade bodies. And we actually lobby on all, all different things, but part and parcel of it for me is obviously greater access to finance. And also I have a few customers of my own. I do find time to, to deal with a few businesses and that's so I do actually work at the coalface and raise finance for, for my own SMEs that I actually work with. So that's a little bit about me, a little bit about the session. I'd like to introduce you now to, to the panel. Each one of them is going to give us a very short introduction so you can understand what they do and who you're actually seeing this morning. So, Catherine, can I ask you, first of all, to introduce yourself? Thank you, Adam. Um, my pleasure joining you guys for a really interesting discussion this morning. My name is Catherine Hurling. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Funding Exchange. Funding Exchange was founded five years ago to really have just one mission, which is making access to SME lending more, more it, making it easier to access SME lending and making um, the cost of finance, both for businesses who are accessing finance to lower the cost and give them transparent access to choices, as well as reduce the cost for lenders who are providing finance into the market. And so, the way we've solved the problem is actually by using data and data analytics to help and seamlessly bring together SMEs and lenders who want to transact with each other. Um, as a result of this, we've built a huge amount of data around what is the demand and supply for finance in the UK market and have quite unique insights into how both demand and supply for finance is changing and has been changing during this this most recent crisis. Fantastic. So that's be interesting to draw some out and bring some out as we go through uh, this session. Um, Simon, perhaps over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Adam, and hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Simon Curit, and I'm the CEO of Funding Options. Uh, we have a vision to be the leading plan for SME finance. What we do essentially is we give businesses a holistic view of their funding options from across the market in as near to real time as possible. Okay, super. Um, and now we've got a couple of lenders on the panel as well. So um, can I introduce um, Stuart Doiny? Stuart. Yeah, thanks, Adam. So firstly, thanks for the, the invite today. It's great to be part of this panel. Um, as I said, my name is Stuart Doiny. I'm head of FinTech Strategy at Shawbrook Bank, and I'm working on the digital transformation of our business finance division, which is, it seems quite a key, uh, quite a key topic for today. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Shawbrook, we've got ambitions to be the best specialist bank in the UK. And as a specialist lender, we're on a journey to looking to significantly grow our lending book, but also not just with technology, but also through great people. In my 20 plus year career in SME lending, it's led me on a journey from senior risk and strategy roles at Barclays, right the way through to the world of fintech and innovation. And I've seen firsthand how technology transforms lending practices and can deliver great customer experiences. Super, thank you. And um, finally, but not least, um, Lawrence Giglioli. 
Thank you, Adam. I'm honored to be a part of this panel. Um, so I actually uh, am the founder of LenderWise. Um, LenderWise is the first lending platform for SME telecom operators. So we are working in a specific niche market that actually we're experts in. We come from the telecom industry. Um, our lenders have the opportunity to earn interest rates off the entire global telephony market. So we're doing something that's very new, very unique, and with a tremendous potential. Uh, we're actually booming in this moment of COVID. Uh, I have 30 years experience as an entrepreneur. I, I have a master's in telecom. I was a country manager for Dun & Bradstreet and for a Swedish multinational telecom operator. Great, fantastic. So, so thank you to the four of you. Thank you for joining us today. I mean, I've got some, some in-depth questions and really, you know, let's, let's dive straight into them. And I'll start with you, Katrine, if that's okay. Um, specialist finance has a real role in supporting the future growth of our, our economy. How do we make the most of this over the next few years? Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question. I think, uh, as you said in your introductory remarks, uh, in the UK, we're actually in a very fortunate position that we've had a very vibrant development in the non-bank finance market over the last 10 years. Um, that has uh, a fantastic um, opportunity for businesses to access many different forms of finance outside of the bank's uh, core products that they provide. One of the challenges that has arisen as part of this revolution is actually it's becoming more difficult to navigate uh, what the right finance solutions are. It's no longer going to your bank and being given a loan by your bank that is necessarily the right um, solution. What we think is happening um, as these, these, these funding solutions are being evolved and are getting more sophisticated and getting a lot more competitive, they're no longer just for businesses that cannot access bank finance, but actually they're very actively um, competing and are often providing more attractive terms than bank finance solution can provide. But what we are experiencing and where we are um, trying to drive the transformation as well is that we are making these finance solutions available at the point where the business is actually engaging with their finances. And that is today no longer <laughs> the bank branch, but it often is within a digital format. It can be within your cloud accounting solution. It can be actually within your digital yeah. bank account. It can be coming through other digital means. And so where we believe um, the evolution is going is actually being able to access finance products at the tip of your fingers at any point in time where you're actually needing finance and being able to do that so that you can be confident that you're getting the right product for yourself and your business. So having transparent choices available to you. So we believe that that is the future. Of course, we're navigating through choppy waters. And so I'm sure we will come back to this. Um, the route towards those solutions over the coming months will be interesting as we will see less and less financing being yeah. made available through government and banks, and therefore a really pronounced shift into non-bank finance solutions. Mm. I think that's important. I think it's very important that we, we will explore that later on, that the, 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 the end user knows where to go when they need finance, rather than going somewhere, being rejected, then looking to, for an alternative. I think they need to go to that place straight away. So Simon, it's really the same question to you, really. How do you feel that we're gonna make the most of this over the next few years and what do we need to do as an industry? Yeah, so I echo a number of the points that um, that Katrin made just before. Um, the fundamental challenges I, I think that still remain within the industry are fragmentation uh, of the SME finance sector itself. Um, but Katrin also mentioned earlier on the, the challenge of education. So, um, you know, it's still very much reality that a lot of businesses really have no idea what finance options are available to them. But what we're doing as, as platforms um, is we're helping to solve those problems. So, you know, both funding exchange and funding options, for example, um, you know, we offer an incredible uh, rich amount of um, uh, information which helps to educate businesses. But for me, the area where it gets really interesting is in this fragmentation of the SME finance sector. So if you're a business in the UK today and you need access to funding, what do you do ultimately? There is no de facto one place that people go. Interestingly enough, that de facto place, and it's not even anything really to do with SME finance, 
it's Google. So people go onto Google, they type in any number of different search words. And immediately what happens is they get served up with pages and pages of uh, parties, third parties, all of which are competing for the same customer. And that ranges from the banks to the challenges, to the neos, to the alternative finance providers. Yep. You've got your um, comparison websites, uh, traditional brokers, platforms, other fintechs. The list is seriously as long as you're on. The, the, the challenge that we're focused on solving is this one of fragmentation. So we want to utilize our platform to give fun, uh, so to give customers uh, that holistic view of the market yeah. without having to waste oodles of time because they don't really understand what's available to them. We can serve that up to the customers through our platform uh, and, in real time. I think that's very important. So Stuart, from a, from a lender's perspective, I mean, I, I've seen Shawbrook grow from, from, from the very, very start yeah. where you are today. So, so what's the, what's the a lender's perspective then on how, how we're going to make the most of this um, opportunity over the next few years? Yeah, so, so, so I think I definitely echo the thoughts of Katrin and Simon. I think you know, they both make some really, really valid points. I think, I think there's, there still remains a real big opportunity for specialist lenders in the market. Um, and especially those that are willing to kind of really understand the borrower profile and importantly have some flexibility over kind of some of the standard product offerings that we see from the big banks. Um, I mean, for, for, for that reason, I think, I think both brokers and uh, the platforms are likely to play a huge role, I think, in making sure that these specialist products are available to SMEs and also importantly that they're easy to understand. I think one thing's for sure, and I think certainly our outlook at Shawbrook is that you know the, I think there will be a steady business flow for lenders that can be more flexible, and, and certainly be you know kind of have that view of um, accepting business across the risk spectrum. I think to, to make the most of it at Shawbrook, we've got a really strong emphasis. Hence my uh, my job title and role at the moment around the whole digitisation. I think across all of our divisions, I mean we're targeting instant decisioning with even complex uh, credit and complex assets. And being, being specialist, I think, doesn't mean that you have to have a manual labour intensive process. You can still take advantage of technology. And we're really just using it to, to kind of do all the heavy lifting and deliver a much stronger customer and also broker experience. I mean, we, yeah. we really see it as our role to support all businesses in achieving their growing ambitions. Great, thank you. Now, I've been, I've been a big fan over the years of obviously specialization within the special special finance sector so another level of speciality and, and Lawrence I think you've chosen to go down that route where you, you become specialist in one particular area of, of finance. Correct that's exactly precise I think specialization is fundamental because it allows you to focus and to specialize uh, uh, specifically in something in our case yes we are lender wise is specialized in the telecom sector. So we are actually embedding finance with telecom, um, giving the opportunity to earn interest rates off global phone calls, essentially. Specialization is fundamental because it allows you to automate things. It allows you to employ technologies which are fundamental to optimizing on procedures, which means things get more efficient, they get cheaper to run, and it means developing uh, further financial products. Uh, so I totally agree with the, with the question here is how does this help the economy? It does uh, because it's essentially injecting uh, liquidity into the market and liquidity is fundamental uh, just as long as it circulates within the economy. Uh, the greater number of people benefit, the greater number of SMEs can benefit when there's a greater circulation, circula circulation of liquidity in itself. So both finance and the specialization of finance are fundamental elements for any economy. Great. Okay. So we started with a big question, you know, how are we going to make use of this over the next couple of years? So I just want to drill down into a couple of different sectors and I'll probably split this question into two and talk to the finance platform first and then you to the lenders with the other question. So as we've already agreed, commercial finance has progressed tremendously in recent times, and this includes the growth of the finance platform. And I was there, April 2014, when George Osborne announced that the banks were going to have to refer any declined clients out to, to a finance platform. And obviously, you two that are on the, here, you've led the way with this since that very, very start of this process. So how are you planning to support SMEs in the future? What are you going to do? So, Simon, can I ask you first, how can you make your the SME community 
more aware that you are there as a first port of call? Yeah, look, it's a great question because uh, um, teleporting, if you like, having those telepathic messages into businesses instantaneously to get them to think of us first uh, is, is obviously quite difficult. Um, you know, there's obviously different ways and means that we can do that. So, I mean, funding options has been around for, for quite a considerable amount of time. So I think there's already a degree of brand awareness, but as a platform, so we've seen increasing digitization, uh, obviously with, and I'm gonna be the first to mention COVID, apologies to everybody, including listeners, but we've, we've seen increasing and accelerated digitization over the last year. And really for us, and I think for businesses that presents a massive opportunity. So uh, open banking, you know, we were uh, one of the early adopters of open banking. There's obviously open accounting, there's the prospect of open finance, which already exists in Australia, for example. But these kinds of technology innovations are giving us as platforms much greater capability. So we are able to, um, you know, I mentioned the word real time on several occasions, we're able to uh, actually serve up real time decisions to customers. Mm -hmm. Some of the biggest challenges that businesses face is getting access to finance quickly. As a platform, interestingly enough, interestingly enough from a, um, you know, we're very focused on partnerships. Um, so, so be that the lender partnerships, be it corporate partnerships, we are effectively lender agnostic, provided that lenders are giving customers uh, essentially the right kinds of solutions and, and good value. So, you know, the likes of Shawbrook, um, uh, for example, you know, we will deal with all of the banks, again, the NEOs, the challenges, all of the alternative lenders. The platform is agnostic from a lender perspective. Where it works best is when we can make use, obviously, of uh, the innovation that we have to, to drive um, more of a digital process. Um, and, and that obviously uh, yields benefits for businesses from a time perspective, also from a, to give them that holistic view. Very, very difficult to do that manually. Um, ultimately, uh, uh, from our perspective, we recognize that, yes, we have, um, you know, deep technology capability or deep tech capability, deep uh, uh, sort of data analytics capability. But one of the things that we've been focused on at Funding Options is actually retaining what we call a hybrid model. So we see the future, uh, certainly the near to medium term, we see the future as this hybrid uh, tech and human model. We're not hiding behind technology or hiding behind data. We absolutely see the humans and SME expertise, you know, that is the crux of, 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 of our success ultimately. It's a bit like if you watch rugby, if you're a fan of rugby and you know, Eddie Jones for, for the English rugby team brings on his closers, his finishers at sort of 50, 60 minutes throughout a match. Um, you know, we can present solutions very, very quickly and easily to, to our business customers, but actually quite often you need a human to get it over the line to, to make sure that that really. customer is comfortable and they find the right, they find the right solution. Great, I agree with you completely. Catherine, really, it's a, it's a similar sort of question to you, really, to understand how you've been at the heart of this from the beginning. Obviously, I've known you for, for quite a long time, working with your finance platform, helping SMEs. You know, what we want to do is to build on that. So how do you think that you can support more SME firms in the future, get the funding they actually need? Hmm. No, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And um, What's really interesting, I think there's different strategies that you can pursue. And I think uh, Simon is quite right in saying that a uh, digital model that is supported by humans is very successful. I think it is particularly successful where there's more complex choices that uh, businesses have to be have to make. Um, we believe that there's additional segments where a business owner who has financial um, awareness as a consumer of, of products and can make intelligent choices can actually self-serve quite effectively. It's not the only model, but I think it is one model. And in those cases, what we believe is critical, and we believe this is likely to be somewhere around 90% of all transactions. What the critical piece is, is to be available to the business at the point where they actually have a need for finance. Either they recognize the need for finance, and are actively looking for solutions, or they may not even have realized that they will have a need for finance. Uh, and we can actually assist them in understanding that this is going to be a need and at the same time help them access uh, solutions. So for us, that many years ago meant that we had um, decided that the way we want to work and engage with businesses is actually being 
embedded in the environment where the business is engaging with their finances. Being embedded means for us two things. It means we are integrating into technology that businesses are using, whether it's cloud accounting or price comparison websites, or it's other partners who we're working with like challenger banks, who are using our technology to provide access to finance. So being able to integrate into solutions and being able to engage the business at the point of need of finance is really important. But to be successful in this, and this has really been core to what we're doing, is to be able to demonstrate and to prove that we're treating every business fairly. That every business yeah. is getting access to the right funding solutions and we can demonstrate why these funding solutions were the right ones and others weren't available. Because what we need is our partners trust that we're going to treat every business exactly as if they are the most important customers that we've ever served. And there's not a single customer who can fall through the cracks. So as a result, the way we have built our business is very much with the focus on being able to integrate into existing technology. So everything we do is API led. And secondly, everything we do, we can demonstrate compliance compliance on data management, compliance on treating customers fairly. And yeah, we believe yeah. that this is quite different from, this is quite interesting in an industry where, where compliance, probably large parts of the industry are not regulated. If you're taking that approach to a market um, where there's very different standards and practices, you, you have actually quite a unique positioning in the market. And we, we believe that this is the direction of the market, that everyone in the market will actually be going trying to drive greater compliance, management of data, treating customers fairly. And so we want to be part of those who are leading the market in that direction. Yeah, well, I'm going to come on to regulation later on, because I think it's important that, that the audience understand how we are regulated and what we can expect from, from regulation, and particularly from the regulator in the future. Um, but before we get on to that, really, I'm going to turn to you, Stuart, and actually going to change the question around a little bit, because I had a conversation some years ago with um, the person who, who ran Facebook in um, the UK and Ireland, I think, at the time. And we were talking about how we could actually um, promote SME finance through Facebook. And, of course, it's very difficult to make it work. And Katrine's actually already said that she wants to be more embedded at the point that the business needs finance. And you have to be there. So when that business actually says, right, I need some finance, who do they think of? But and importantly in this also in this role is the commercial finance brokers. So I'm going to move it on a little bit now. And, and I don't think there's enough recognition within the industry for the role played by the broker in getting a deal over the line. How do we change this? Because I mean, Stuart, uh, sorry, Simon's already alluded to the fact that you may need a human to actually get the deal done. So I want to ask you that question. How can we raise that recognition of the role they play? You know, I, th I think I think that's a good question. I think, I think, I think number one, I think at Shawbrook, we we definitely value that broker, I think, in the broker relationship. And I think for that reason, you know, I think up to today, it does, does remain our primary acquisition channel. You know, we, we do have a good network of brokers and we certainly value their, you know, their expertise in getting deals over the line. I think I think the cost of acquisition for lenders is, is, is getting higher. Um, you know, so I think for, for a bank like Shawbrook or another specialist lender, you know, it becomes increasingly difficult to kind of go out there you know, and compete with some of those players on the on the Google spend side of things. And I think to have to work with an intermediary where, you know, they understand your risk appetite, they understand your product very well, I think that's really valuable. And I think given I think certainly given the impacts of post COVID lending, I think brokers will arguably play an even more important role, I think, as we hmm. so I think we're gonna find that certain lenders are certainly going to be a lot more cautious in the marketplace. Um and I think We've definitely also seen a shift into more tech-based marketplace solutions like, like funding options and funding exchange. I think where you know there's definitely appeal there in having that kind of 24-7 ability to apply for finance, you know, to have it available, you know, exactly when you want it, when you need it. I think, but it's probably fair to say, and I think Simon and Katrin would probably agree with this, that you know the conversion rates of deals which come onto those platforms probably aren't, aren't as high as what you would get if you went through a commercial broker. So I think there's definitely value in that kind of human interaction. And, and let's, let's face it, we're going to have some SMEs out there that are completely comfortable applying for something online. 
But I think there'll always be a proportion of the SME base that really value that human interaction element. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's definitely going to be vital and vital important as we move forward. Great, super. Lawrence, I just want to combine those two questions together, really, that, that I asked the other panellists. And, and I'd like to understand a little bit more how you go about um, acquisition of business. How do you get to your telecoms customers? Do you use a combination of technology? Do you use a combination of, of uh, having a physical intermediary? How do you find your business? How do you bring your SMEs to you? Well, um, actually, I think we're extremely fortunate <laughs> because being so specialized uh, with LenderWise, specific to the telecom industry, actually clients uh, reach out to us uh, almost directly, almost exclusively, thanks to word of mouth and thanks to the fact that we are solving a major problem which they all have, which is liquidity, uh, negative cash flows. Um, we are talking about the wholesale telecom industry, which is very cash intensive uh, and where the big players, the big boys, uh, the big clients, the big debtors all pay typically on 60 days. And our clients, uh, which serve them, uh, need to pay their suppliers on seven days. So there's in general a 53 day cash flow gap, which is the solution that we are providing, uh, the, the problem that we're solving rather. Um, so we're quite fortunate. The cost of acquisition for us, for a client, because we're so specialized, is extremely low. Uh, the size of a loan is, is very high. Uh, and just to give some numbers, uh, I mentioned that we're a startup, but uh, well, we've been going at this for about three and a half years. We launched our platform a year ago, and we've already processed over 60 million pounds on our platform in, in, in 11 months. Uh, so we are growing extremely rapidly. Um, and so I, I realized that being so spe specialized means that we have unique selling propositions in the industry. It means that our cost of acquisition of clients is much lower. It means that we have a, an invoice marketplace where we're inviting more and more investors uh, to onboard and to bid for invoices specifically in the telecom sector once again, uh, which obviously are credit vetted by us with our own credit risk model with a, with an insurance wrap as we have APIs towards insurances. Uh, so we provide a whole series of, of, of credit risk mitigating services. So I, I realize that we're lucky being so specialized. This specialization means we don't have to have huge teams of people seeking clients, nor huge teams monitoring their credit risk or the payment behavior of, of clients. We do use technologies a lot, coming to your question. Uh, we have a very robust and sophisticated platform, which we have developed, which allows us basically to automate almost every single function from onboarding of a client to onboarding of a new lender or a new investor uh, to the ma ma managing and monitoring of the actual invoices to the monitoring of the payment behavior of the clients, all fully automated, all in real time, which is allows us to uh, optimize all the procedures to give lower costs to our clients, better returns to our lenders, uh, and it's essentially a win-win situation. Yeah. I think that's important. I think, you know, having the, those, those groups, those trade associations for specific areas of industry is, 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 is important. I work with yeah. 170 trade associations through my, through the Westminster group that I'm a director of. So I'm aware of how the trade association networks work. Um, the last, I think, presentation I did to a trade association was to the Association of Industrial Laser Users. The AILU are specific, but they have specific needs um, that might not necessarily be recognised by Shawbrook or by funding exchange. They have a specific need. So I can see exactly where you're coming from, Lawrence, with, with what you're doing for the telecoms industry. It's just a shame mm -hmm. that we can't have a list for every single trade, trade association in the UK and it all might work, but that just wouldn't be possible. So we'd love to support that. The note. Sorry? <laughs> we would love to support that. Yes. But while, while we're on the West, Westminster subject now, and I think we've explored the, the role the intermediary plays and what we can do and what we need to do in the future to, to bring that more to the fore. But so since 2008, there really has been a tremendous growth in the number of lenders to business in the UK. I think prior, prior to 2008, we had about 100. By 2009, I think that dropped to somewhere in the region of 40. As I've alluded to, there's in the region of 350 to 400 um, lenders to business at the moment. 
But what can we do? What can we do within Westminster to encourage the government to, to increase accessibility and visibility of, of that lender community to our, um, to our small business owners? Perhaps, Stuart, I can start with you. Yeah, I, th I think I think it's I think it's an interesting one. I think I think firstly, I think it might it would be interesting to actually look and see, I think which lenders emerge from the pa the pandemic at the moment because again we hear, you know, lots of news where you know certain lenders have, have pulled back, whether that be kind of temporarily or, or or permanently. So I think it would be interesting to see kind of what I guess what that landscape looks like. I think once once you know kind of we we emerge and, and things start to recover, I think. In, in terms of the bounce back loans and CBILS loans, I think the way the BBB obviously went through and accredited a whole bunch of additional lenders in the market has definitely helped. Because I think we found that, you know, we've we found a whole host of SMEs probably borrowing from banks which aren't their, their main high street bank. And I think it's it can only be a good thing for the market, right? So I think it's really good for SMEs to be introduced to those different options that are out there. Um, I think it's probably fair to say the you know the, the the scheme that's in place at the moment for the main bank rejects and, and the rejected loans probably isn't working particularly well um in, in that you know i'm not quite sure that you know the, the banks are doing absolutely everything they can to direct that that loan traffic to to the platforms or and whether that be on a, a tech level or also at the actual rm level within within the bank i think there's definitely some more work that could be done there i think in terms of you know, education with SMEs and really opening out their their choices and opportunities. And and I think let's face it, we've we've got I think the technology there to do it now, especially with uh, with with through both Simon and Katrin and their offerings that they they've got out there in the market. I think I mean I I've obviously part of my role is is to be in Westminster to lobby, as I said, for for greater access to finance. And you know I've sat with funding options and funding exchange around the table with various people, whether it's in Treasury or the British Business Bank or individual MPs over the years or, you know, even at party conferences, we've obviously debated this subject. And uh, so really, I mean, Katrina, sort of coming back to you, I suppose, to ask the question, how are you seeing the engagement with Westminster to try and increase this accessibility and the visibility of what we're all doing? Mm, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, I think there's still um, in parts of government a lack of understanding of the role that the non-bank finance market plays yeah. and in fact um, I would have raised with the government during the crisis that their focus on pushing money out through banks is actually undermining some of the work that has been done um, over the last 10 years in terms of building a diverse flourishing non-bank mm -hmm. finance sector um, not just in terms of not leverage, let, leveraging digital capabilities to avoid loans going out to fraudulent applicants, for example, which is something that um, the more digital lenders would have had capabilities to support the government in delivering. But even where um, through Bank of England and other institutions that have supported the banks in, in uh, delivering Beebles and Siebel's funding, those mechanisms just weren't being made available to the non-bank finance providers and thus severely reduced their ability to support um, businesses during the crisis. I do think this has set us back. And so my first ask to the government is just to recognise that in normal times, particularly the micro-businesses, more than 50% of funding is coming from non-bank finance providers. So actively um, undermining the non-bank finance uh, sector, not actively, probably unintentionally un undermining the non-bank finance sector is in the longer term going to be to the detriment of anyone. So this is probably the most basic ask of Westminster. I think my observation, and this might be slightly surprising, is where um, Westminster, Westminster is trying to proactively steer the economy or the finance sector. It does not tend to work out very well. Um, I don't believe that mandatory business referrals from the banks or mandatory referrals from the banks is an example of success. So equally to what you're saying, um, I believe it's treated as a compliance exercise. The banks are doing exactly what they're being asked to do but we're not using these types of processes to do the right thing. 
And in that case, where it actually is clear that the banks would have an interest of delivering better customer experience, connecting into the ecosystem, being able to do the right thing by their customers, we would actually do better with less regulation. I do know that we're working with several of the uh, tier one banks. I do know that their concerns are often around connecting into the ecosystem, uh, whether that is actually in conflict with some of the regulation that's been put in place by the government. So in, in some cases, um, I feel that the government is not doing enough in terms of the foundations of ensuring that the alternative finance sector can flourish. There should be more support for for the sector in terms of access to funding, etc. On the other hand, the proactive choices that are being made, I think, are often not quite right in terms of leading to the right outcomes. So actually pulling back from mandatory bank referrals and putting more emphasis in the underlying infrastructural <laughs> setup for alternative finance to flourish, I think, would be a much better emphasis. Okay. I think, I think one of the important things which we we need to get to do again is, is collectively lobby to, as, as a group, as perhaps we were before, to lobby um, again to raise that awareness within Westminster. Simon, um, it's over to you. It's the same question, really. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about what more can be done within the um, within Westminster? Yeah, in the interest of time, I think I've, um, Katrin articulated it extremely well. I absolutely echo the views. Um, the challenge we have, so actually Katrin and I and, and, and many other people spent months trying to lobby through various different channels in, in Q2 last year to try and get the alternative finance sector to be uh, embraced or be given uh, an equal opportunity uh, mm. to help distribute uh, funding, vital funding to, to SMEs in the UK economy. You know, we spent months lobbying with ultimately zero effect. Uh, and I don't say that to be overtly negative, but ultimately it didn't get anywhere apart from making us extremely tired and pretty frustrated. I think, um, you know, we could all look back uh, uh, for, for a very long time and sort of uh, articulate the what, what should have happened. Uh, ultimately, you know, the past is the past. What I would like to see is I would like to see Westminster far better informed as to the capability and beneficial impact uh, of the alternative finance sector, because I don't think that's been fully recognised or embraced. You know, the, the government's immediate uh, sort of knee-jerk reaction to embrace the banks uh, as soon as COVID hit, you know, pretty much told us everything. The key thing is looking forward. So are they going to bring the alternative finance community into the fight to allow us to rebuild from what has been a pretty horrendous year? And that, for me, is ultimately the focus. I think the term giving uh, the alternative finance sector uh, access to the alter sorry the term funding scheme is vitally important because it is not a level playing field. There are phenomenal lenders that simply cannot lend right now today, uh, even though there is huge demand. They cannot lend because they do not have access to liquidity. It's as simple as that. And that, for me, is a big, big, big issue. Mm. But we need to look forward. It's all about um, it's all about the, uh, the the you know the, the regrowth, if you like, the rebirth of economy, and, and and how do we accelerate that uh, to its full extent? Okay, I mean, because we have seen some lenders that that um, stop lending in in March last year and haven't come back and won't come back. We have lost some of those some yeah. of those lenders that we know so well. Prior to that, they were doing a great job, but we have we've lost liquidity was part of it. Um, obviously, not ac having not access to all the different schemes also didn't help. But you know, there is some liquidity out there, particularly in the um, especially property finance market. There's quite a lot of money. Um, commercial property did very well in 2020. I make no bones about that at all. But other parts of the economy did find it more difficult. Of course, they would. Now, um, really, to turn it to you, Lawrence, I suppose, just on this final point within Westminster, I suppose. You're fairly um, protected from from this particular discussion because you're dealing solely within within one industry. Is that correct? Yes, it is correct. But I would like to mention that. Uh, well, as a, I've been a country manager for Dun & Bradstreet, I've been able to compare uh, uh, government regulation in multiple nations in Europe and in Germany, in France, in Italy, in the UK, and I want to say that. Uh, 
uh, what I see in the UK is actually very positive. So uh, I want to launch some compliments to the UK government as a whole from this point of view, from my experience. Um, and and because I see it's it, it's trying to do its best. It's developing regulations which are clear, which are understandable. It's getting involved as much as possible. No one is perfect, of course. Uh, but but I see actually it's it's one of the reasons why Lenderwise is set up in the UK actually, um, and um, my suggestion would simply be, uh, in addition to all the lobbying uh, activities of course, but into the sandboxing, into the FCA activities and what have you. My suggestion is that technology should play a role also because in the end it's it's proper that a government wants to. Uh, uh, Guarantee transparency, security, reasonable rates, uh, um, so and better reporting, and all of this is uh, doable with technologies which are integrated with the lending platforms and the banks themselves. So I think technology uh, coupled to the regulation, to the lobbying activities, and to the regulation uh, is the key to making things better for all parties in the end. Yep, I agree with you. And I'm just sort of coming to grow on that um, regulated question, which obviously you've mentioned and Katrine mentioned at one point. So, so coming to you, Stuart, really on on regulation, we've seen regulation creep within commercial finance since the uh, advent of the, of the change of the Consumer Credit Act, shifting over to the FCA in 2014, and we've seen more regulation coming in. There's still obviously unregulated parts of the sector. What can we expect to see from the regulator in, in the near future? And do you think more regulation is going to help SMEs find finance, or do you think it'd be a bit more of a hindrance? Yeah, you know, I think it's an interesting one. I think it's certainly been one uh, that's been on my mind for a number of years. I think where we keep kind of thinking more, you know, more and more regulations coming, and, and, and it's probably fair to say that there's not been a huge amount that's been been particularly disruptive in this space. Um, but one thing, one thing I have seen is that I think an increasing number of lenders are adopting a regulated view on their own regulated business, should we say? So mm. I think yeah. there, I, I think lender readiness for, for for more regulation is definitely there, and I think it can centre from everything around the customer journey, right the way through to important affordability. Um, I think I think it's fair to say I think we anyone who's working in the industry would have seen, you know, evidence in the past, we you know where. SMEs have, have, have obtained funding, which perhaps isn't affordable for them, which has led to further problems, you know, further down the road. I think, um, I think increased regulation is likely to help the SME. I think in terms of being offered the right product at the right time, um, and I think it can be your friend, right? I, th I think inevitably, I think uh, it's going to lead. It's going to lead to some changes. I think in customer journeys, transparency, product selection. But as everyone else has kind of alluded to, I think technology is going to really help us here because I think technology really does give us the ability to to kind of drive that whole audit trail and drive that compliance and really make sure that we kind of we're getting everything in the best interest of the SME. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned audit because I think that's important so that you have, you know, particularly through a finance platform. I'm going to come on to Katrine next then on Simon, because that gives us a timestamp search for suitability for that a particular um, lender for a particular SME at that moment in time, who was available and what was available and why something was chosen for that SME and why they went down that route. So you can get that through technology. And, you know, you mentioned, I mean, we mentioned regulation. Recently, obviously, we've had um, the introduction of disclosure, particularly uh, in and around the motor vehicle finance industry. That's something else that has come out recently. And, and all these things are important and are all, are all moving forward. So, you know, the last, last word really from Katrine and Simon on disclosure. And then I'm quickly going to move to the very final question, which is your thoughts for a quick 60 seconds on the on the future. But first of all, um, talk to me about regulation then, Katrine. I think regulation is going to be at the heart of how um, our sector is going to be transformed. Um, I think we've seen this in other sectors as well, where uh, increasing requirements are actually driving change of behavior when your customers are requiring you to be compliant. And so what we're seeing right now, and I was speaking to one of the tier one banks uh, this morning, uh, the tier bank one banks are unwilling to work with uh, intermediaries who cannot demonstrate compliance. And so I think we, um, we will see very quickly 
that there is going to be a, um, a minimum standard that's going to be expected from intermediaries to be able to play. And I think this is going to be good news for all of us because it does mean that we're building a more sustainable sector where we have robust business models that are creating value, that deliver value to the customers we serve and that are um, transparent and delivering um, um, a service that treats customers fairly at all times. My personal viewpoint is uh, the question whether uh, an introduction is regulated or unregulated shouldn't matter. We should always aspire to have the same standard around transparency, around treating our customers fairly. And I suspect exactly. with the efforts of the FCA and the uh, direction of travel for many of our lenders who are not going to engage with you if you aren't able to demonstrate this, that we will see a transformation. But the transformation doesn't just mean technology. It may well be that um, advisory services become incredibly valuable, but advisory services that can actually demonstrate that um, the human interactions are done with the best interests of the business at heart. And I think this is all good news. I don't think this is bad news yeah. at all. I would like this to see happening even faster. Yep, yeah, no, agree with you. And Simon, I'm sure that you will agree as well, because I'm going to ask you just very briefly, um, comment on regulation, then I'm going to ask you first for the positive message for the future, but just a comment on regulation, if you can. Sure, absolutely. So um, we, we definitely embrace it uh, and we're ready for it. So I think, um, you know, as Katrin's mentioned, the, the, the extent to which we're integrated with so many different lender partners of, you know, whether they're tier one banks all the way down to a sort of boutique specialist finance house, uh, you know, we have to be incredibly robust in, in our setup, in our procedures, in our compliance. Uh, you know, we have all of the relevant ISO certifications. So from our perspective, we embrace it because we want to actually see, uh, you know, th there may well be pockets where practices aren't quite up to the, uh, the requisite level across the, uh, across the sector. And for us, um, you know, that needs to be tackled. Uh, absolutely. Um, from a, sorry, what was the, the final question? Well, here's the final question. Then I'm going to put you on the spot to begin with, because the audience is very keen to, to um, hear how our panelists what our panelists think about the future. Um, there's a lot of interest in the small business community and, and we know with 5.4 million SMEs across the UK, they're gonna lead us as we move forward from the pandemic. So how do you think the next years are gonna be for small businesses in the UK? Um, just before I go on to that, because I lost my train of thought very slightly on the last question, just one thing that, that, that is more just to sow a seed of a thought process in people's minds, we're talking about regulation. But mm. I think it's, so we're massively committed to the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole concept of treating customers fairly. And one of the things that we're thinking pretty deeply about is the impact of human bias uh, in the introducer process. And I think it's very interesting when you look at the dynamic of, you know, the, the sort of traditional broking side of, uh, of the sector, you know, the, the platform side of the sector and what impact humans play in that. Uh, and it's just, I'm not going to comment too deeply on it, but the human bias aspect is a really intriguing one because there may be an argument to say that the machine uh, doesn't have any bias. So therefore, in, in terms of treating customers fairly, if you have access to largely all of market or majority of market and the machine can make a decision based on fact, um, that's quite an interesting one. Anyway, that's uh, hopefully that's not confused people, but it's something we're thinking deeply about at Funding Options. In terms of the message for the future, so I'm a, a natural optimist. Um, you know, I believe that the market to an up to a large extent is pricing in uh, a recovery from Q2 going forwards, whether that be April, whether that be May. Um, you know, we have seen incredible resilience in SME across the UK and across the globe, um, which is phenomenal to see. And you know, our hope is that the majority of them make it to that point of recovery. If you look at the hospitality sector, for example. They've been absolutely through the mill for the last 12 plus months, um, but they will be the ones when we are unshackled and when the weather gets a bit warmer uh, and the beast from the East two disappears, they'll be the ones to accelerate from zero to 150 yeah. miles an hour incredibly quickly. I think um, technology enhancements, new innovation is just going to keep going uh, at a pace. And my personal belief is that is only going to be for the benefit of SMEs, whether it's open finance or any other kind of 
uh, initiative for us it just gives us greater capability to improve competition and improve service for, for SMEs across the UK. Okay, super, thank you. And Lawrence, um, from, from you, your views really on, on what you think the small business community is going to, how it's going to fare in the next few years? So I think, uh, I think the direction is positive, actually, obviously, um, because there are more and more fintech platforms and technologies which are helping to feed liquidity to SMEs. Uh, I mean, six years ago, I remember I, one of our major banks that we worked with six years ago, or not ages ago, six years ago, they were telling me that uh, a loan um, or an invoice discount of a value of less than 50,000 pounds was not convenient for them. They lost money on deploying mm. less than 50,000 uh, pounds. Today, that is actually an, an absolutely attractive amount for a platform. The technologies automate things. They make everything faster, cheaper, uh, bigger. Uh, technologies are fundamental. It means uh, SMEs get cheaper sources of funding, bigger sources of funding, uh, and it makes it better for the banks also, which will ultimately be buying more and more, if not implementing their own platforms, buying platforms that are, that are available on the market. And as a confirmation to this is the fact that the FT Partners, which is one of the biggest global fintech investors, uh, in the world puts non-banking lenders at the top of the list in terms of valuation. Interesting. Yeah, so we are in absolutely a high growth market, which is a benefit to investors, to banks, to SMEs, and to lenders. Brilliant. And Katrine, um, do you concur with, with the thoughts of, of Simon and Lawrence? Do you think in the next few years, we're just gonna, we're gonna recover and bounce back very quickly? So I think, um, of course, we all hope that we're going to accelerate out of this crisis. Um, I think we will have quite a few bumps along the road. Um, we will see that some businesses that uh, have been surviving, particularly on, on government support, uh, will fold. Uh, some of them are viable businesses that should have survived, but because of the debt load that they've had to take on as a result mm -hmm. of the crisis, they will find it hard to free themselves from those shackles. Um, we do think that that actually calls for lenders, specifically and funders, to have more visibility into the affordability of lending, both existing lending that's been done through government schemes, but also new lending. And so the emphasis that we see is really around creating greater visibility between the business and the funders to have tools that allow them to understand affordability, not just at the point of a lending decision, but even through the life cycle of the business. And to be much more proactive in terms of working through difficult situations where you don't wait for missed payments or even ultimately a default to jointly arrive at solutions where the business benefits because the business is viable and can continue to make repayments on existing commitments, but the ben lender or funder also benefits by actually protecting their uh, their balance sheet. Yeah. So we yeah. we believe, hopefully, that one of the good things coming out of the crisis um, is going to be that funders and lenders uh, will engage with businesses in a much more constructive way rather than in a mm. quite transactional way to help the businesses navigate through the environment and thereby remain or return to viability. Super, thank you very much. And Stuart, sure, it um, rests with you. Um, the final question is, how do you think it's gonna be for SME funding over the next few years? Yeah, so I think, I think firstly, it's good to hear, um, I guess the positivity of the panel um, in, in, terms of the, in terms of the outlook and I think I would definitely share that. I'm definitely optimistic about the future, but also do acknowledge that it's going to be a bit challenging as well. I think I think that the pandemic, as we know, has impacted certain you know, some businesses more than others. And I think it's definitely led to a big shift in how SMEs operate, how they think, how they adapt to different market conditions, etc. I think ultimately it's kind of led to you know I guess a different creative way of thinking, which I, th I think if I was to look in my crystal ball, we'll probably end up in um, you know, creating more opportunity, I think, for lenders out there who can offer that difference in flexibility and ultimately really understand, I guess, those changes and shifts in the, in the marketplace. I think 
there are many that from what i see there's definitely many um tech-led specialists and challenger banks that are, that are kind of ready to pounce on the market opportunity for those SMEs that are targeting growth rather than just survival, I would say. Um, and I think if you look at it, they're ideally placed, I think, to, to kind of provide that flexible lending, you know, match, you know, wrapped in a really good, nice wrapper, um, digital or, or, or manual, which is really going to make that difference in the marketplace. And I think we already know that SMEs aren't really getting the support they want from the bigger banks with rigid risk policies, broken servicing models, etc. And I think it's only going to lead to that continued trend of more movement towards, you know, towards alternative lenders. And I think post pandemic I with digital. That's... Sorry. So yeah, with everything that, that's been said, because the opportunities for specialist finance are, are huge. We need to continue to raise mm. the awareness for the SME community. It's work that I've been doing for the last 16 years to, you know, trying to raise that awareness, both within the SME community, within Westminster, wherever I can. And, and it's great to have so many allies that, that think in the same way. And obviously you're doing all your own work as well. To, and the more we do to raise that profile, the more it's going to help SMEs to get the funding they need and the more it's going to help the, the economy, which brings us back to the very first question. You know, I like these panels when we could have, when, when the time wasn't enough, we could have gone on, you know, the same amount of time again. And that's fantastic because it, it means that we're all heavily engaged. The, the subject's interesting. And it also means that we've all got our own opinions, which all come together, I think, in a very, very positive manner. So all I can say really is thank you to you all. Thank you to Katrine. Thank you to Simon, Stuart and Lawrence for, for taking part. It's been a really, really enjoyable session. And I hope that our, our audience enjoy it just as much as we've done. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.